Welcome to the Lock In live stream. It's Friday. It's time for a few whiskeys, time for a bit of crack, time for a chat. Thanks everybody for joining. Welcome wherever you're joining us from. And let us know where you're joining from. Three amazing whiskeys tonight. We're going to have a bit of crack. We're going to be joined by special guest Michael Cowman shortly before we bring Michael in. Want to make sure that everybody is tuned in and you know what we're drinking. And for those of you who want to drink along with me, I've got three affordable whiskeys tonight. Uh, two of them are readily available in the United States, and the third one not so much. All three of these are available widely in Ireland. So we're going to drink West Cork blended Irish whiskey, a bourbon cask. West Cork. We're going to be drinking the Sexton single malt from Northern Ireland. And we're going to be drinking Velvet Cap. This is not the bottle it comes in. This is a sample bottle that came from Ireland. The full bottle uh, will make its way at some point, I'm sure. Velvet Cap recently released in Ireland, but we'll be sipping on all three of these. All three of these are super affordable whiskeys. The two that I've got here are all less than $30. In fact, they're less than $25 in the United States when I just purchased them. So really affordable whiskeys. So we're going to have a bit of crack tonight, sipping on the whiskeys, telling a few stories, and uh, coming together to make sure we're all doing okay in strange times. So hi to John Fleming, Johnny McNally in Long Beach. Chris Connor in Michigan, Michael Farrelly from Cork, drinking Barry Crockett, great stuff. John Fleming is busy down there in Killarney selling all his Waterford whiskeys, I'd say. Val in Waterford, everyone's drinking Waterford whiskey today. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Lots of interesting things happening in the world of Irish whiskey this week. So we are going to uh, crack on in uh, just a minute. Uh, let me see the first drink I'm going to, the first one I'm going to pour is going to be the West Cork. I'll bring Michael on to join me, but let me know where you are in the world and where you're joining from. Sean O'Neill is drinking Velvet Cap. Great stuff. Red breast cask strength. Lorcan's got his West Cork and his Velvet Cap. Brilliant. Great stuff. <laughs> Michael, who's in the green room waiting to come on, says that it gets nicer every week in the green room. We might leave him in there a bit longer, so he loves it so much there. <laughs> Connor's joining us from Dublin. Connor shared a picture of a lovely bottle of whiskey on Facebook today that he might open on this week's live stream. You never know, we'll see. Chris killed his sexton last week, so he's on Tully Rum Cask and Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Martin's here for the turtleneck. We're all here for the turtleneck. The things I do in this heat, it's 80 plus degrees US temperature, about 30 something degrees Irish temperature, and I'm putting a turtleneck on. I think I'll have to get rid of the turtleneck in the future, and or else do like a sleeveless turtleneck no arms, for, get, get a bit of breeze going. That'll be the goal. Joe Moore from Dublin Airport is joining us with some good news from Ireland. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Ireland's on the right path. Brilliant. Great stuff. Right, so we're going to have a few sips tonight, tell a few stories, and talk a little bit about Irish whiskey news before I bring in uh, my special guest, who's back by popular demand. I want to talk a little bit about what's, uh, what's been happening in stories and sips this week. So uh, for those of you who follow along the Stories and Sips podcast, we had a great conversation this week uh, in tandem with Teeling Whiskey's fifth anniversary or fifth birthday. The distillery is celebrating its fifth birthday this week. And I had a chance to sit down with um, their global, bla uh, global brand ambassador, Rob Caldwell, who uh, chatted with me from Ireland. And we had a great chat about all things Teeling. And if you haven't checked out that episode of Stories and Sips, I encourage you uh, to do so. Teeling is a brand that has uh, kind of um, been a bit of an enigma to me over the past few years. I've tried to understand the myriad of releases, the 80 plus different whiskeys they've released, uh, tried to understand their philosophy, and I've not always got it. And so this was a great chance for me to understand it and have Rob explain a little bit more of it to me so that I could finally kind of wrap my head around what Teeling is and what Teeling stands for and what they're all about. So um, new episode of Stories and Sips. It's a podcast, audio only. Here's some video I took in the Teeling Distillery when I visited there last year. Uh, but they're doing really interesting things. They have a really interesting maturation program in place. And there'll be some really interesting global releases coming from them um, over, the next, um, over the next few years, which I encourage you to stay tuned to. But if you haven't already checked out that episode, Stories and Sips, uh, it is available wherever you get uh, your podcast. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, et cetera. So uh, do uh, check that out. Really great chat with, uh, with Rob Caldwell, Global Brand Ambassador this week. 
Uh, Sean O'Neill was at the virtual tasting. Yeah, they did a virtual tasting in Ireland with some of the, I think, upcoming releases that they've got. So really interesting things uh, that, they're, that they're going to be releasing, including a peated uh, whiskey, yeah, which Sean tasted as well. And uh, Teeling is about to reopen in the uh, next two weeks, as is much of Ireland, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's exciting. Connor is looking forward to taking his dad on the Teeling tour there. Fantastic. It is a, it's a good tour. And uh, right there in the uh, heart of the old um, golden triangle of whiskey production in Ireland. <laughs> Michael says, I should be buried the battleship in the sleeveless turtleneck. That's what, if it gets much hotter here, and it will, because we're only in the start of June now, with San Diego is going to get a lot hotter, uh, there'll be sleeveless turtlenecks. Bring a new, a new element of class and style to the uh, live stream sleeveless turtlenecks and all guests will have to do the same they'll have to join me in sleeveless turtlenecks as well <laughs> all right so that is what happened in stories and sips this week great podcast episode uh, with rob caldwell global brand ambassador for teeling check it out this week i've got a really interesting conversation coming up uh, we'll be releasing a new show on wednesday and it's going to be following a new whiskey brand that's going to be released in the united states and in ireland and we're going to track the progress of this brand. We're going to speak to the owner of the brand. And we're going to cover it over a series of episodes over the course of a year or more uh, and check back in with them to understand what it takes to launch a whiskey brand. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm not going to tell you what the whiskey brand is. All will be revealed during the week. But it's going to be very interesting to understand what goes into building a whiskey company and, and, and launching a whiskey brand around the world. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you this week. So stay tuned and subscribe to Stories and Sips wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll release that uh, this week. Jeff is joining us from Indianapolis, killing a few bottles. Jameson, 18 Bow Street. I have the box here. I don't have the bottles behind me, but the box is here because it's the perfect height for positioning the whiskeys I'll be drinking tonight. So we'll start there with the West Cork. Stick it up on the box there. Chris said I should add the sleeveless the sleeveless turtlenecks to the Stories and Sips store. Be careful what you wish for. They'll be coming. All right, so let's bring in our special guest, Mr. Michael Cowman, joining us all the way from Ireland. How are you, good sir? Not too bad, Barry, not too bad. Um, I, I'm looking at myself here in the camera. I look like a sheep that needs to be to be shorn. Uh, the, the barbers are still shut here, so it's a, it's a difficult time in Ireland, you know? Would you not do it yourself? I've been, I've been doing mine myself, like. Uh, I, I, I've done that before and if I end up, you know, taking a nick out of it, the whole lot has to go and, you know, there's not much left on the top there anyway, so one has to be careful what one does. Once, one's it's, hair. once it's gone, it's gone, like, there's no, it's no coming back once you shave it off. Well, I, I'm scared, like, that if I share, shave it off, it just might not come back, you know? <laughs> yeah, the, the wig look, it wouldn't be a great look, would it? No, I, I, I'm not into it, I'm not feeling it. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for saying I was, you know, highly requested to come back because my mother was up all week writing those emails to you um, to, to request my presence. She sent enough money. Uh, she sent about three euros and 30 cents. She got all her coins together in an envelope and sent them over to me. I said, that'll do it. I, 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 that'll easily buy, buy him a, a place on the live stream. So You're cheers for joining. <laughs> I'm a cheap date, yeah. Three euros is about all it'll take. Send five euros, you can have the whole show yourself. You don't need me at all. <laughs> so we thought we would... Um, I wanted to, to chat with you this week. We were, we were going back and forth about what we would talk about. And uh, my goal with these live streams is not just to bring on those who work in distilleries or those who are blenders or those who are, have a direct hand in the whiskey, but it's to have a bit of crack. It's to talk about the whiskey and it's to hang out with people who are a good bit of fun and a bit of crack and who know what they're talking about in the world of Irish whiskey. Uh, and that's why, that's why you're here, apparently. You're here to fill the void of crack, which wouldn't be there, wouldn't be present with me alone, like. Ah, uh, very good. I, I was going to ask when the, the knowledgeable people were getting here, Barry. Um, I was a bit worried if you were relying on me, you know? The crack Another 15 manage, minutes now. <laughs> Another 15 minutes. They're in the, they're in the green room waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to do a virtual uh, part one of a virtual trip around the visitor centers of Irish whiskey distilleries today. There, There's a few of them are starting to open back up over the next few weeks, which is exciting. We know many people can't travel to them yet. Certainly people in the US have put their trips on hold, but we want everyone to put their seatbelt on and strap themselves in to the, the, the virtual bus that will be driving around the distillery centers tonight, talking a little bit about uh, which ones have great tours and what they, what they offer and what you can expect. And then we'll continue it in a few weeks. We'll come back and we'll do part two uh, of more of those visitor centers. So that'll be the, that's the crack we're aiming for tonight. 
Absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to it because there is some great tours out there. Um, and I think tonight we're covering some of the the some of the bigger ones, some of the older ones that have been around for a while anyway. So yeah, no, it's it's uh, some great experiences to talk about anyway. So before we go into the distilleries, let's talk a little bit about some things that happened in the world of Irish whiskey this week. Uh, with a very fancy banner there this week in Irish Whiskey News. So you can't move in Ireland today uh, without seeing mentions of Waterford Whiskey. So uh, we've seen that Waterford Whiskey has found its way to shelves in Ireland and Germany and other places, and there's tremendous excitement around it. Uh, you're closer to it over there than I am. Uh, I'd say you can't move for mentions of it. Uh, it's it's crazy. Between Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp groups, lads are just throwing up pictures of their bottles of Waterford whiskey. And it is, it is really exciting. I think the the link you threw up during the week with all the details in it, it's it's incredible what the lads are doing. And I think the excitement around it is is something we haven't seen for, well, since two weeks ago when the Red Breast Dreamcast was launched. <laughs> it's been a whole two weeks since the, since the, the, the last greatest sellout, uh, which yeah. happened, uh, yeah. The, the, the thing that Michael's referring to, I shared this week on Twitter. So I'm showing you here pictures of the bottles, but on the reverse of those bottles, every bottle has a code and that code can be plugged into the website and it's tied to that specific bottle uh, or that particular release. And what it does is it shares on the website uh, the facts related to that release. And we say facts, but I mean, facts is not sufficient a word for what you get access to, is it? Uh, it was incredible. I mean, there was a sound cloud that played the sounds from from the farm down in Bano. And being an expert boy, it, it just reminded me of home. But it was it was incredible the level of detail between the cask, the it, pictures of the soil, interviews with with the farmer, um, with Ed Harper down there. Just an incredible level of detail that I don't think we've ever seen uh, on any any bottles of whiskey before that that I'm aware of. Certainly, anyway. Never. I've never seen. And it's not marketing it's it, it's just it's data related to the to the release yeah. and uh it's amazing to see such a, such an anticipation and demand for whiskey that has been yeah five or six years uh people have been waiting since they knew this was about to happen they've been waiting for this whiskey and now to see it hit the shelves with almost no marketing in the traditional sense of stories contrived stories but rather no here's an interview like you said with the farmer here's uh, yeah. some sounds from the farm here's here's a, an in-depth discussion with our distiller about what we're doing and why amazing level of detail and access isn't there yeah and i think the, the well the build-up has been coming over the last last couple of years we've all known it's coming um i think you know there's there's some big personalities involved with, with waterford and they've been talking about their ethos around around what they're doing and it's it's hard not to get excited because it is a new approach to how irish whiskey is being done so it's just something we all have to taste it now and see if it's any good, I suppose, is, is the next thing. So for those of you who are in the, who are joining us from the United States and who are uh, watching with interest, and those of you, especially in the Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group, will see I'm sharing a lot of details about Waterford, and I've been accused of being overly interested in what they're doing, and I'll take that accusation gladly. I am overly interested, but for good reason. But the good news is it's coming to America. Um, a bit like Eddie Murphy did back in the day. It's coming to America. And it's uh, going to be here in October, November. Uh, I had word from the distillery this morning that there will be three single farm releases finding their way over to the United States in October and November. I don't have details of the states yet because they can't release those details because they're finalizing the last legal loopholes and hurdles. America is just 50 countries that you have to figure out all at the same time. And I have been uh, promised that as soon as there is word of where it's going, we'll be able to share that information first in the Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. And not only that, we're working on trying to figure out ways to do some uh, events to celebrate and introduce people to the whiskeys from Waterford. So stay tuned to that. That's coming hopefully in the next few months. Um, well, definitely in the next few months at land, but hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll have some information on what states are going to get hold of, um, are going to get hold of the, uh, those bottles, which is, which is good news. Queveen is uh, disappointed that there wasn't a full length video of the barley being planted, growing, and then harvested. It's true, they really missed an opportunity there um, for a, like a, a, a six month GoPro. That would have I mean, been, that, that been the job like. I, I would, I would uh, maybe, I, I would certainly watch a speeded up version of that. I think it'd be quite interesting, but maybe that's something they can do for, for the next, one of the next single farm releases anyway. Maybe, maybe. So uh, let us know folks what you're drinking. Uh, it's time for us to have a drink. Michael, what are you drinking? 
Ah, uh, listen, no, I said I'd stay loyal um, for the first drink of the night. I'll, I'll stick to my old favourite. I'll stick to the paddy. Um, so threw a little bit in the bottom of the glass here just while I was while I was warming up in the green room. Uh, I said I'd have a little bit of paddy anyway, so let's launch it. And what, what pray tell is paddy, Michael? We've never come across this unusual. You haven't come before. across this, this, this fabulous liquid paddy. So paddy is a, a triple blend in that, uh, you know, single, single pot still, single malt and uh, grain whiskey uh, blended together. Um, which I think maybe, you know, people were, were claiming other things last week that there was only one of those type of whiskies in Ireland, but Paddy is certainly one of those. And it's from, from your home county of Cork. Um, so West Cork and East Cork here uh, lined up in front of you, I guess. We've got Cork covered here on the screen right now, East and West, as, as it should be. Should we even go on? We should just end the live stream now. We did it. We got Cork. This is the pinnacle. Over. This is the peak. It gets no it, better. I can't hard. tell you how much it hurts me to say that, Barry. Um, you know, I just, yeah, listen. You have a real chip on your shoulder against Cork, and it's we do, there's no explanation for it because it's not data-driven because you know how good Cork is. Like, I, I think it's, yeah, maybe it's just a personal thing. Maybe it's the flashbacks from my days in the Navy uh, living down in Cork. Maybe that's all it is. I just, every time I close my eyes, I see Spanish fishermen, and I see, you see naval <laughs> ba the naval base. It's It's tough, you know? I don't, I don't want to know what you see when you close your eyes. Those are dark places. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to go down the live stream. <laughs> so Michael's drinking Paddy from Middleton, East Cork, um, and it's owned by Sazerac, an American company now, but has, is, is a well-known Cork brand and has been for more than, uh, more than 100 years. I'm going about 100 miles west of that down to Skibbereen in West Cork, and I'm drinking uh, West Cork bourbon cask, which is a blended whiskey as well, uh, but it has only two. Uh, uh, different uh, whiskey components in it. Michael's got three in his. Mine has got a uh, grain, 75% grain and 25% uh, malt component in this. And then uh, obviously aged in a bourbon cask. So I think we both got relatively young whiskeys, but cork whiskeys nonetheless, which makes up for any lack of age we might want uh, in a whiskey. Uh, so Slaunja, let us know what else everybody else is drinking as well. You know, I think it's, it's cool with the with Paddy, you obviously have uh, the whole story behind Paddy Flaherty, which I think we mentioned before, and you mentioned it quite a few times, and you've been to his grave uh, down <laughs> in Cork. But yeah, he's, he's, a very, he's a very cool ambassador to have for the brand, or the original, what I like to say, he was the original brand ambassador for whiskey, uh, sales slash brand ambassador, much like myself these days. There's not many whiskey brands where you can say to the person you're talking to, well, you've been to his grave, uh, but yes, I've been to Paddy, Paddy Flaherty's grave. Um, yeah, Paddy's a great cork ambassador, one of the greatest salesmen apparently of all time. Uh, but you're trying to follow in his footsteps to have a, a Michael brand of whiskey at some point in the future, maybe. Maybe, maybe someday. I was I was looking for for names during the week on Instagram. Um, none of them I can actually share on the live stream here with you, Barry. I'm trying to keep it PC because I, I realize it's still early ish on in it's the a family States. show. Yeah, it's before family the watershed. Um, all right. Well, we look forward to those uh, non PG. Uh, name for whiskey. Uh, let me see. Uh, Peter's drinking West Cork bourbon, not a, but not a big fan. Fair enough. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's different thing. So West Cork. What what I find really interesting about West Cork, and I think a lot of their spirits are young. Um, the ones that are coming out of their distillery are young because they've only uh, they're a young distillery. But what's fascinating about West Cork to me is, and again, we're going to hurt Michael here with the with the cork ingenuity that we're going to talk about. But there he had three lads, three. You know, two fishermen and, and somebody working in the in the in the um, kind of agri tech sector, food sector in in Ireland. Three friends who were sitting in a bar, and the two fishermen were out of a job, and they decided that they should start a whiskey business together. The three of them. And rather than the next question being, well, where could we find stills or where could we buy the equipment from? They said, sure, geez, we can make all that stuff ourselves, couldn't we? And didn't they build a distillery just made of, and they made everything in it themselves from scratch. I, I remember. I remember being at a tasting with John. Uh, one night down when I was in the Cork Whiskey Society and when he, I, I hadn't heard the story before and he said, no, no, we made our own stills or I made the stills. And I was kind of going, what? You made your own stills? You know what I mean? Because you're always, when you're hearing about distilleries, lads are talking about, oh, I got it from four sites or I got it, you know, I got it from wherever. There was a three-year waiting list and uh, no, I made them myself. And I was like, this lad is a genius, is he? Or, you know, so They're crack just ama amazing yeah. story, amazing story. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a factory. It's, it's a massive industrial operation at this stage, but it is that they, they built the main bits by hand. And I, I, have, I haven't been to the distillery. I have a 
like we mentioned in one of our previous uh, episodes, live streams. I have a cask sitting down there in West Cork. I've not been down there at all myself, but I have visions of these lads walking around the, the grounds with hammers in their back pockets, like so that when, when something needs to be fixed, there's no phone calls made. It's just, here, I, I have you the right size hammer there. I have it here. Yeah, here you go. Old school Tapping distilling, away. Barry. Old school distilling. Old school, old school. And uh, my understanding is that all of the whiskies that they now release uh, contain their own liquids, that they're no longer sourcing liquids from third parties. So that's great news. Massive operation, and they're doing a lot of third party whiskies. Uh, out of there and supermarket brands and things, but uh, just a really massive operation built on just a bit of kind of hard work and taking chances and risk taking. Half of Skibbereen is employed by the one That's distillery a, now down there. Yeah, it, it's a it's a great local story, and you know they're a huge employer now down in Skib. Um, so it's just it's a really cool story, and well, the lads the lads have been around since 2012 or, or so. So it's great to see them, you know, getting their own whiskies out there, getting everything that they've distilled into the into the, into right. the bottle. Jeff asks, is, is West Cork pot still? Because my understanding is that they make their, they make the three different styles down in West Cork, don't they? Yeah. They, they, yeah, have they, grain, do they have yeah. grain, yeah. So grain, malt, and pot still. My barrel is pot still down there, but yeah, they make all three. And uh, they had, yeah. I, I, I think it's still, I'm not sure if the rocket is still there. Um, they had at one point, certainly the fastest pot still in the world. It was known as the rocket. So, you know, they, there was a, there was a quick fire pot still, uh, so the liquid went through it very, very quickly. It was known as the rocket. It's amazing. If you look at the, the south coast of Ireland and you go from West Cork to Waterford, West Cork are asking, how quick can we make this whiskey? And Waterford are asking, how slow do you think we could make this whiskey? Well, maybe it's, <laughs> it's something, making... to do with their, something to do with their accents. I mean, if you go to Cork, you know, people, people speak very quickly sometimes. So, you know, where there's, there's a bit more of a draw in, over in Waterford, over in the Dacia, so... Maybe it's just the, the pace of life. Well, we've a lot to get out. We've a lot to say in Cork. Like, there's a lot to be said and done, you know, so you've got to go quickly <laughs> through it. <laughs> um, Chris says they're also producing for Glendalough, Tipperary, and a few good small brands, which yeah. is great to see. Uh, so, yeah, and they're good good friends to the trade. And uh, I hear, I've heard great stories from people in the Irish whiskey world of how West Cork have helped them out of a jam if something went wrong with new brands and new distilleries and new new whiskey bottlers. West Cork have stepped up even when it wasn't in their financial interest to do so just to kind of lend a hand and help out which is great to hear yeah I think so uh, andrew asks sorry go ahead no i was saying i think we, we talked about dingle um the last time i was on you know and i think west cork were, were set up almost around the same time or even a little bit before you know and I, I don't think they get the the same love as somewhere like dingle which i guess is a smaller craft distillery sometimes so it's it's always a, an interesting story and like we say such a feel good story for that part of Cork. They don't get any attention. They have no, I don't think they have a marketing team to the best of my knowledge. I think they have one person in marketing. Um, and so they have, they, you don't hear a lot about them, but most of their whiskey is produced for other people. So that's why we're not hearing a lot about them. Uh, yeah. but the other brands are kind of doing the marketing for themselves. Uh, Stephen McGuinness, our buddy says, John is a genius. One of the nicest guys you'll, you'll meet. I've heard that from so many people that uh, John, John O'Connell, his name is on the bottle there. When I first saw the bottle, uh, I was, it was probably four or five years ago when I first started getting interested in whiskey again. And I only picked up the bottle because it didn't have the shape of cork down there on the, on the label, of course. Yeah. You're, you're an easy sell. You're, you're kind of a, you know, you're a one-trick pony, Barry. You know, there's it's sticking out a picture of cork or no flag on something, you'd be grand. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Take my, take my money. Who do I make the check out to? <laughs> right. So listen, that's what we're first drinking. We're on our first sip. Uh, but let's talk. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing a little virtual tour. We're going yeah. to travel around Ireland. Uh, are you in the driving seat or am I? Who's driving? And, and who's... You, 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 you can take it away, Barry. You know, um, it's, Just remember, it's the left-hand side of the road back over here. Right. Uh, somebody in the Facebook group said that today. I said, we're going to do a virtual tour. And they said, don't forget to drive on the left. I said, well, should we be leaving the cars at home tonight? There'll be no driving tonight. We'll be grand. So there's, no, there's nobody got the cars. We're in a virtual tour. Um, where do we want to start on our virtual tour around the country? Where are we going to go to first? I suppose, does it make sense to start up in Bushmills up the, the north part of the country, I guess? I'm not sure it does. All right, so Bushmills, um, the oldest distillery in the world, or is there a competitor, a contender, <laughs> a challenger to that that we'll talk about a little bit later? Somebody else yeah. might challenge that. Let's just oh, yeah. say Bushmills has been around for a long time. 
Yeah, well, let's let's not get into figures and numbers because I'm sure our friend who just commented, Stephen McGuinness, might might weigh in on that in a, in a moment anyway. But yeah, Bushmill's been around for a long time and one of the definitely one of the most storied Irish whiskey brands that's out there. And I think everybody who's ever had a few glasses of Irish whiskey definitely knows the Bushmills distiller. Had you done the tour in Bushmills yourself, Michael? I did it in, I think it was in February, actually, just, well, maybe January, February, just before the lockdown. Um, my, myself and the better half, we went up and we did the tour of Bushmills. And I did it. One of the, th- the Bushmills itself as a distillery is great, obviously. But the, one of the best things about Bushmills is the location because you're right up there on the Causeway Coast and there's so much to do in and around Bushmills from the Giants Causeway to Carragher Reed Road Bridge to if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you know, there's obviously a few of the, the sets where Game of Thrones was filmed that are up around up around that part of the country as well. So just, yeah, it, it's a really great weekend and somewhere you can spend a few days in. And it's the distillery is expanding. Their production is, is increasing. They're increasing the number of warehouses. Um, they they are were in the past few years acquired by uh, the parent company of Jose Cuervo Tequila uh, yeah. that has, is doing some interesting things with the with the brand. Um, the, the next whiskey that's on my list that I'll drink in a second comes from there, Sexton, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but uh, it's home to more brands than just Bushmills, isn't it? Uh, it's home to more brands than just Bushmills, and they bottle more than just Bushmills up there. You'll see a few different uh, familiar green bottles and uh, bottles with black labels you, you might you might see up there that you wouldn't necessarily might think would come from there, but... Listen, Barry, I don't know how many secrets you want to reveal on the show. So uh, All all the secrets. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I, I remember someone telling the story before about they went up to the bottling line and they kind of looked in onto the bottling line and there was a familiar green bottle um, going around on the bottling line as well. So, you know, they bottle various things up there as well. But uh, it is it is a very, very cool distillery, very cool place to, to visit as well, you know. It speaks to the, the collaboration of Irish whiskey. Yeah, so the, the Bushmills Distillery used to be part of the same company um, that is the Irish Distillers that produces Jameson uh, for a period of time, for a number of years, but 20 years, in fact. Uh, Bushmills is part of Irish Distillers. It is no more, but they still bottle uh, Irish Distillers products up there. And they, um, yeah, there's a lot of trade of stock goes back and forth for blending purposes, back and forth between the two distilleries. So good collaboration there. I've not done the tour in Bushmills. I've never made it that far north on the island of Ireland, but it's on the list. Yeah, no, well, absolutely. I would recommend it and take a weekend or take a long weekend um, because there is so much to see and do up there. Once you're in the village of Bushmills, you're not too far from Port Rush. And like I mentioned, the, the Giants Causeway and places like that are only a few minutes down the road either. And there is, there's a few different experiences you can do once you're in the distillery. So obviously you have the standard tour, um, but then there is kind of premium tours and uh, stuff as well, where they'll they'll talk you through the full range from Red Bush right up to Bushmills 21, which is a personal favorite of mine, I do have to admit. Love it. Love Bushmills 21. My favorite single malt of all time is Bushmills 21. Uh, absolutely love it. People laugh at me because they, the hardcore Irish single malt drinkers laugh at me because it's not a cask strength single malt. It's just bottled it. I think it's 40% actually, uh, but yeah. it's a beautiful whiskey. Yeah, stunning whiskey. Uh, also, Bushmills, of course, is home to, uh, yeah, they, they do bottle other whiskeys. Uh, as Quivine asks, why are we showing pictures of Conor McGregor's distillery? Uh, you may have, <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, is that Conor McGregor's distillery? <laughs> uh, the, fourth, the, the, the fourth biggest Irish whiskey brand in the world. Apparently. Yeah, is it, I saw that. I saw that statistic during the week, um, but it's, it showed Redbreast as being the third biggest selling Irish whiskey. Did it? Uh, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure about that, but I, I think I just got the the headline figure. You know, the usual clickbait that anything to do with his name <laughs> comes up. You know. I yeah, I know. Um, yeah, let's just say that there's a popular mixed martial arts fighters whiskey comes out of those same uh, same walls. Um, Shane raises a good point. He respects Bushmills, uh, but he wishes the distillery would focus on innovating and improving their own lineup of whiskeys. So uh, Bushmills is home to really old stock of whiskey. Having been around for so long, they have the the benefits of mature stock of whiskey, and a lot of people would love to see it more in in bottles uh, with their own name on it instead of selling it off to, to others. Uh, but we don't know if they're going to do that. But we're we're talking more about the tours anyway today. And uh, Bushmills is a great tour to do and a great part of the country to visit. Um, you've got so many interesting sites, like you mentioned, the, the Game of Thrones has 
exploded tourism in Northern Ireland or did certainly before um, before all this broke out. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the, I suppose, the downside of what's happening. At the, one, of, one of the many downsides of what's happening at the moment is the tourism industry has, has taken that, that nosedive. But certainly it is one of the parts of the country that should be on your list to visit um, when you do eventually get over to Ireland or when people from, you know, Ireland eventually start start traveling again and holidaying again. But yeah, class part that's of the country. It. Can't overstate it. And a lot of a lot of great innovation happening in Northern Ireland too. So you can go visit Bushmills, and you can go go to County Down and visit some of the great distilleries that are popping up in County Down. And um, yeah, between Antrim and Down, there's a lot going on in the north. Uh, the County Down, the new distilling capital of the of of the uh, of the island, I think. Up down, uh, Bushmills are adding to their core range this year. Says Chris, they aren't as far behind as they seem. So that's great to hear. Look forward to hearing Chris, what Chris what always gets the inside track. Chris always gets the inside track on these things, so he's always a good man to go to for a bit, bit of info. The oracle of, of whiskey detail, Yeah, our, our boy Chris. All right, so that's Bushmills in Northern Ireland. If any of you from the United States have been to Bushmills, let us know if you've done the tour. Uh, I've not done it myself, uh, and I'm, I'm curious to do it. I've heard, I've heard good things about it. I'd love, to be, I'd love to do some cask sampling in Bushmills, but if anybody's been up there, share your thoughts in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. And I think it's important All to right, say so. it's a, it's about three hours three hours or so from Dublin anyway. So I think that's most people's reference point when they they hit into into Ireland. They they hit Dublin. They go right. How far away is it from here? I prefer to measure everything in terms of how far it is from Cork. But sure, I suppose we can use yeah. Dublin for now. Yeah, <laughs> we'll use Dublin for the moment. All right, where are we off to next in our virtual tour? Back in the bus we go. Where are we off to next? Back in the bus, I suppose, uh, we take a three and a half hour trip down to Kilbegan, will we? And straight down and we can oh. we can have the, the debate about which one which one came first. So Kilbegan is um, arguably the oldest distillery in Ireland. The the nuance in the detail of how both Bushmills and Kilbegan talk about their age is really interesting. Kilbegan talk about the oldest continuously licensed distillery, as in the license for distilling has been renewed every year, be it by the townspeople of Kilbegan or the, the companies that have owned the distillery. Whereas Bushmills, uh, the argument is that, well, there was a license granted to somebody nearby at some point, and now there's a distillery in some place near there. Um, we're not gonna solve it tonight, but uh, just know this is a major bone of contention in the world of Irish whiskey. Yeah, I think everything everything is in the nuance and everything is in the detail. But Kilbegan, since about 1757 anyway, um, there has been a, a distillery in Kilbegan. And so as we can see, 1608, 1784, 1757, you know, they're, they're all just numbers, but it's certainly been there for, for a long, long time. And they reopened the visitor center again in, in 2007 to celebrate 250 years of the distillery, but it did go through a few hard times uh, as well. So the, the distillery shut in 1953 and was turned into a pigsty in 1963. And it wasn't until the townspeople really wanted to take the distillery back and reopen it as a distillery that, that things started to happen again. So Kilbegan, right? And the heart of the, the Midlands, I guess, is uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a town that's now bypassed but it's a it's a great little tour to visit, and the great thing about the tour in Kilbegan is it very much shows old school distilling. You know, it's it's one of these it's very traditional distilling, um, a very small pot still, um, and you know it's just a a great little tour to see a bit of a throwback to how things were, Cork, uh, how things were in in Irish whiskey distilling. There are um, I've got a picture here of some of the old stills the old column stills and, and pot stills that are there in the distillery. Um, and I don't know the full history of these, but uh, I'm sure uh, more educated souls than me who are on the live stream will, will, will weigh in a little bit. But uh, I know that I do understand that these column stills uh, have a, have played a role in Irish whiskey history too. Do you know anything, anything about them? Uh, I don't, but I'm sure Stephen McGuinness, who I know is watching can weigh in and give us a few little facts but he did give me before the, the live stream started. So Stephen is is one of the, the brand ambassadors, um, sales, sales people, brand ambassadors for for the brand. Um, so he sent me over a, a cool a couple of cool little facts, but they only make a barrel a day for six months of the year. So in many of the distilleries in Ireland, you're talking about 
you know, thousands and thousands of LPAs and, and leaders and stuff, but a barrel a day for six months of the year. So it is a limited uh, kind of production and it is one of the oldest and one of the smallest pot stills that's out there that's actually making whiskey. And so it's only since about 2008, 2009 that they're actually back making whiskey, really. So there's one release a year, is my understanding, from this from the Kilbegan distillery. Yeah. The Kilbegan that we, the, the blended Kilbegan that we may be more familiar with and that's on many shelves in the US, uh, perhaps a little bit confusingly, doesn't come from the Kilbegan distillery. It is the Kilbegan brand that comes from the sister distillery, the Cooley distillery um, yeah. in County Loud. But there is one release, uh, experimental, innovative release every year now from the Kilbegan distillery in that old still. Yeah, and I think... There is a couple of little bit, bits and pieces about Kilbegan that, to follow the story, it can be a little bit confusing. So they started making whiskey in 2008, 2009, again, but they didn't actually have the brewing and the fermentation kit. So they were taking the wash from Cooley, bringing it down to Kilbegan and distilling it. So it was in 2010, I think, that they added the actual brew kit and started doing the entire process there in the distillery. So the new additions of Kilbegan that we see out, which have won a few awards now at this point, they've been how you saw it after the, the single uh, the single pot still and the small batch rye um, came out of the came out of the distillery itself. Interesting uh, facts there first from Steve McGuinness. The pot stills are actually old Tullamore stills, and the column stills have never been used. And John Teeling apparently bought them on eBay. I never thought I'd I'd hear the words John Teeling and eBay in the same sentence. I mean, look, it's a. Uh... Those were the days when you could buy column stills on eBay, I guess. <laughs> the good old days, huh? Whatever yeah, happened they've, all been, they've all been snapped up at this stage. You know, they've gone to various distilleries around the country. There's no column stills left on eBay. <laughs> there wasn't a day in the past where you couldn't get a good old column still if you looked on eBay. Like. And I tell you, you'd get a pot still at the weekends if you were looking hard enough. And now you have to go to Scotland to four sites and, you know, down to John in West Cork to get your, your pot stills made. See, this is why Irish whiskey is so great. The, the characters uh, slash chancers that uh, have built the industry through uh, chancing their arm and a bit of grit and, and hard work over the years is uh, is unreal. Like. Yeah, certainly when you dip back into the past when things were a little bit tougher, you know, the industry wasn't wasn't going maybe as well as it as it is now. Um, there are some great stories out there of how people were or pulling themselves through and, and, you know, managing to keep distilleries and, and brands and stuff alive. So, yeah, there's definitely some great stories back there. So, Kilbegan is a great stop off if you're driving. If you do fly into Dublin, which many Americans do, they go straight into Dublin and then they'll look for where to go from there. Last time I flew into Dublin with some friends, our first um, next stop was Galway. So, you cut across the country and then halfway between Galway and Dublin, you'll see a sign that points you towards the, the, the Kilbegan distillery. Take, take that detour, take a little tour and go in there and see how distilling used to be done uh, and see how they're doing it in, in that small um, pot still uh, today and how they're producing those innovative releases. I think it's well worth a trip. Great little tour. And I did a I did a, a, an episode of, back when I was doing only video episodes of Stories and Sips last, probably two years ago now, I did an episode about Kilbegan. It's on my YouTube channel because I, I came across this amazing story about how the Kilbegan distillery almost brought down the Irish government in the 1950s. And it was to do with all kinds of horse trading and backhanders and deals that were going on between the government ministers at the time and businessmen. And there may have been passports involved, but uh, and I don't recall the full story, but it threatened the, this sale of this distillery uh, back in the day threatened to bring down the Irish government, which is, um, is there nothing that whiskey isn't good for? Well, it's a pity you can't do it now. Well, sure, listen. We won't solve all the political problems on this live stream. Uh, no, uh, but no, I think it is. It's a fabulous stop off on the way across the Galway. Um, another fabulous part of the country, which, you know, unfortunately doesn't have the, the distilling heritage that Kilbegan has. But our next trip down the road is only a short little stop off down the road in the Midlands. Where are we going to now? Are we going to Tullamore? Oh, the dead center of the country. The graveyard. We're going to, we're going to Tullamore, so are we? We will. We'll go to Tullamore. We'll go to Tullamore. So we had uh, Donna Stewart, Tullamore brand ambassador, joining us last week from about 45 minutes away from me up in uh, Newport Beach in California. And she was great crack. And uh, Donna shared some stories of Tullamore. We're going to touch on them again. But uh, for those of you who joined last week, you might have got a lot of these stories. But Tullamore is home to two 
Irish whiskey uh, brand homes from the same brand, Tullamore. Uh, we've got the Tullamore Distillery, the brand new Tullamore Distillery, uh, which is uh, recently opened and isn't open uh, for regular tours, to the best of my knowledge, but it is by uh, private appointment, I think, and by private reservation, to the best of my knowledge. Somebody else might correct me on that. But then, and we'll talk about that in a second, but then there's the old Tullamore Dew Visitor Centre on the banks of the river there. Um, Michael, have you got some facts about this one? Yeah, so that's the, you're talking about the old bonded warehouse. So Tullamore, uh, there since 1829. So Daniel E. Williams of the Tullamore Dew. So a lot of people think it just refers, a lot of people, I'm sure you covered this last week, think the Tullamore Dew just refer, refers to the drop being a bit of Jew, but it is Daniel E. Williams, uh, the name on the bottle. And they're, you know, they have that open since uh, September 2014 was when the brand new distillery that you've referred to opened. And again, similar to West Cork, it, uh, they make all three styles of, of whiskey there as well. Um, but yes, there since 1829 and right smack bang in the heart of the, in the, heart of the country. Um, so there are a few different tour options here as well. So you have your standard tours, obviously, but then there are some more in-depth experiences from a kind of a tutor tasting to a more in-depth uh, experience where you go behind the scenes and down into barrel warehouses and that kind of thing. So it just depends on how in-depth you want to get uh, when you're in Tullamore. And I know that uh, Donna mentioned last week that the new Tullamore distillery is this self-contained little whiskey city in that they've got their own, you mentioned making the three styles of whiskey, but they've also got uh, their own bottling uh, line, uh, their own bottling plant on site as well. So we're gonna be doing everything in the one place and eventually moving all of their distillation from where it is currently distilled uh, somewhere else south 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 coast um they're moving all of that up to the midlands i mean well <laughs> yeah no i think i think it is uh, why wouldn't you get another mention in but uh it is a state-of-the-art facility and i think it just makes sense for them just to to bring everything into into one place but yeah when it opened in 2014 it's a it's an extremely impressive building i haven't managed to get in for the tour yet i have passed by um, that's about it. And to my my eternal shame, I haven't managed to, to get myself in there for the tour because I suppose one of the things about doing whiskey tours of Ireland when you go to Tullamore, make sure someone else is driving because it's a it's a hard place to get into and get out of is the only thing. So I'd say renting a car and having someone else drive is, is your best option when you when you come to Ireland. We need a whiskey bus that just does loops of the distilleries around Ireland. You can just hop on, hop off. It's always going like. There could be a business in that. I think. I think there's a there's an idea there, definitely. Jeff says that Tullamore has the ultimate distillery experience tour that starts at the distillery. Americans are very familiar with Tullamore Dew. It is the second biggest selling Irish whiskey brand in the world. Huge pop, pop uh, huge in popularity here. Uh, I was surprised when I first moved to the US, and when I and then when I started getting interested in whiskey, to to see just how widespread Tullamore was. Because growing up in Ireland. I don't know about you, Michael, but I didn't come across Tullamore that often in Ireland, and I later learned the reason for that. But it wasn't it wasn't a big domestic seller in Ireland when we were younger. No, cer certainly not. And definitely, you know, one of the brands we've mentioned there already, Bushmills, Paddy, which I have in front of me, Jemison Powers, would have all been far, far ahead of Tullamore Dew anywhere that I was drinking when um, since I was growing up. And even even now, I think it's not as as visible a brand here as it is in the United States. And same as yourself, I think when I learned Tullamore Jew was the second biggest Irish whiskey brand uh, globally, I, I was a little bit surprised. I remember when I was just getting into the into the industry and I remember thinking, oh, wow, okay. So it's it's obviously a huge focus in the US market and you guys no doubt see a, a hell of a lot more of it than, than we do. Uh, somebody explained to me that the reason why Tullamore was so big overseas was because when the Tullamore distillery closed in the 1950s, eventually the brand was absorbed into um, Powers, John's Lane, and then Irish distillers. And there was a scenario where you had Powers faced with, and, and Irish distillers faced with all of these competing blends and, and quite similar blends. And so the decision was made to export Tullamore Dew and to keep Powers domestically. And so that's why to my understanding, why us growing up, we would have seen more powers domestically, and then the export market saw Tullamore Dew, and then conversely, the export market saw Tullamore Dew and didn't see powers. Yeah, but even now, I think there's some really strange specific markets that are you know massive still for Tullamore Dew. So I think parts of Eastern Europe are huge markets for, for Tullamore Dew. 
just because of historic reasons, because it, it was the one that was being exported to those particular markets. It was the Irish blend that was being exported there. And as a result, it just has a, a huge a huge following in, the, in those particular markets. So yeah, I think it's funny how, how history like that can have such an impact on, on brands. I had a question for Donna last week. I never asked her, but Jeff, I think, has answered it today when he says that the reason the distillery is named Tullamore Distillery versus Tullamore Dew Distillery is that by not including the dew, allows them to distill spirits for other brands. Now, I, I thought my question was going to be about that, whether Tullamore Dew is a brand within the Tullamore stable, where there would be other Tullamore brands, because Tullamore Dew has become both the brand and the company, and I don't know that that's what they want going forward. So maybe naming it the Tullamore Distillery allows for other Tullamore variants. Well, I mean, what, what variants would you would you think of? You could have a uh, what, 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 could, what else would, could, could we do from there, Barry? You know, we could have Tully Cream and Tully Pudgeen and Tully, Tully Turtle. You could get, be a, a whole line of Tully Turtlenecks then as well, maybe for yourself. There can only be one turtleneck, and that's the Stories and Sips turtleneck. There'll be no Tullamore turtleneck. Um, but, but like you've got the, I don't know, is Tullamore, I mean, Tullamore Dew, the brand itself is most associated with the blend, the green, the green labeled bottle. Um, but there have been some really other interesting releases that Donna shared with us, like Phoenix and, and yeah. things like that. But they all have the dew in them as well. So that's who knows what will happen there. Yeah, no, and I remember I, I actually bought a bottle of the Tullamore Dew Phoenix, the cash strength one that everybody that everybody seems to, to go crazy for. And uh, I, I, about three quarters of the bottle gone before I realized it was rare. Or, you know, everybody went mad for this bottle of Tullamore Dew. And it was delicious, but now it's all gone. So it is a, a very sought after bottle, I think. Yeah, I got to find a bottle of it locally because uh, fifty-five percent sounds great to me. Fifty-five percent blend. Um, so, um, Tullamore Dew, uh, we covered it a lot in depth last week. And if you want to catch up on the episode with Donna, where she uh, had the crack with us all about Tullamore, talked about the plans for the future, and shared something that I wasn't aware of, many in the whiskey world might know it, uh, might be aware of it, but the fact that the current Tullamore Dew blend does include some blend, some component whiskies from their new distillery. So they've already started to make the shift from their sourced whiskey from an unnamed distillery that begins with M on the south coast of Ireland to their own uh, eventual blend, which uh, they're going to try and replicate the uh, the formula and kind of the, and the flavor profile. So that's interesting. Yeah, and I think that's always the tricky part when you're when you're changing from something like a sourced liquid to something in your own distillery is keeping the, the flavor profile consistent and keeping everything consistent. Because obviously, like you say, it's a huge brand, has a massive following, so they, they don't want to lose any of that. I know, I know. All right, I'm going to move on to my second whiskey before we get back in the bus. I suppose the I, I, better, bus. I better do the same. Oh my gosh. I'm going back up to uh, Northern Ireland for this one, for me. Where are you going? Uh, I'm going to, to Glen the Lock, the Garden County. So Glen the Lock's pot still. So this is actually the batch number one of their pot still, um, aged in Irish oak. So I, uh, I'm a, I'm a particular fan of this one, um, and aged in Irish oak as well. It's one of the few Irish whiskies out there that is aged in Irish oak. So I think you know this one. Um, you've Dar Gaelic from from Middleton, and Barry, you can correct me, but I, I think that's it. I think that's it. I think uh, I, I haven't heard of any others, and no, of course. There's no whiskey that's fully aged in Irish oak because there's no uh, proof that that would actually work or that Irish oak is capable of aging a whiskey long enough for it to become whiskey yeah. even. So it's all finishing, isn't it? It is because Irish oak has an awful lot of tannin in it. So if you leave uh, if you leave whiskey in it for too long, it will essentially become overly oaked um, because of the, the slow growing, how slow growing Irish oak is, um, has a lot of tannin, which imparts an awful lot of flavor. So that's why it's good for doing a finish. Um, but like you say, yeah, do, doing it longer term would definitely wouldn't work, I'd say. And uh, but it is interesting to think about. You know, Irish Ireland was previously covered in oak trees and oak forests, and we basically cut them all down. So there's very few places now you can source Irish oak from, and it tends to be old landed estates and these kind of places with manicured oak forests are the only places you can you can really get Irish oak now. You know, you, we kind of assume it's everywhere, but to actually find a tree that's suitable for for casks and turning into casks is pretty difficult these days. Isn't it true that you can't cut down Irish oak? It has to fall naturally or, or be, isn't there some rule around like the, the rules regarding when, and I like, you can't just go out with a chainsaw and start chopping down Irish oak for barrels. 
you have to scare you have to scare it down. Um, no, I'm not sure. I'm not you sure. Just sit and wait. I, I thought you just sit in the forest. But, well, like yeah, but wouldn't that be a great job? Just sitting in the forest, waiting, and you hear a creak. And you go, is that a tree falling? Oh no, it's just the wind. Maybe maybe you have to cut. You can only cut it to a certain point, and it, then it has to fall off. It has to fall the rest of it itself, like you know. Maybe, maybe, maybe just lean on it for long enough. Yeah. And then, yeah. Get a big I don't know, somebody told me that. Against it. <laughs> I think somebody, I think no. somebody was having, having you on because certainly there's only, uh, there's only certain trees. Like it's, it's very specific. The ones they can actually use for, for Irish oak, because obviously there can't be any knots or to, to turn into casks. Um, there can't be any knots and, and whatnot. So I think you'd be waiting a while if you're waiting for what the perfect, the perfect tree to fall down. But I am open to correction, but, I think someone may have been lying to you. I think it's a great story, though, because I, I can imagine the ad for a job. If you want to work for Middleton or Glendalough, where you have to wait for the tree to fall down, that your job is just a, a, a forest sitter. And you just sit there and you just patiently, just like a lovely slow way of living. You know, you get paid to sit there and wait for that tree to eventually hit the ground. And then you start the process of chopping it up. Very romantic. Yeah. You'd want to be careful how you say your job title as well, and you wouldn't have want to have a couple of drinks because forest sitter could be misinterpreted, um, and it's very important not to be misinterpreted. So you'd have to do both. I'm you drinking probably would if you're, if you're waiting around all day. Before we leave Glendalough, though, um, I'm curious because I haven't tried that. So that's the pot still that's been finished in Irish oak. Yeah. The, do you get, is there a pine note to that? from the Irish oak, from the virgin I don't oak. Think, I, don't, I don't know if I get, I don't know if I get pine. I, I always think I get a little bit of like coconut or something from it as well, um, from the Irish oak, but I don't think I get the, that kind of pine resin note that you can get, get no. with, with some of them. Um, but yeah, I, I always think, I always think coconut is, is one of my first things. And I, to be fair, I get that with the Mizanara a little bit as well. So maybe I just have a, a hypersensitivity to coconut. When I was trying the dark Gaelic on, on one of the previous live streams, I think it was Siobhan Costello um, mentioned how the Dargale, the, the Irish, the Virgin Irish Oak had lent this kind of pine component to, to it. And as soon as she said it, I thought, that's it. That's exactly what I'm getting. And I hadn't hadn't uh, connected with me. That's what I was getting. And now I, every time I drink it, it's all I can think of. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how when somebody, those tasting notes are so su suggestive. When someone says to you, this is what you'll get, you know, you'll taste the mangoes now. And then that's all you can taste every time you ever taste that whiskey. I know. I'm very suggestive, as, as you can tell from somebody telling me about the man sitting in the forest waiting for the tree to fall. Oh, um, Chris has a question. For Glendalock, he has a batch one, cask three, tree A, 8A. Can we explain the true purpose of this info on the bottle? Yeah, I, I suppose. Well, I guess it's just to uh, be able to identify the exact tree that it came from so that you can go and you can look at and you can actually look in the forest at where that particular tree was so you can identify exactly where that wood came from where that oak came from and there's probably some laws around conservation as well in terms of you need to be able to identify if you're putting down these oak trees or if they're falling of their own accord and you're waiting for them um you want to know exactly where they are but i think certainly when we look at something like middleton dar uh when they list the trees they become very collectible and you can see the differences between each tree as well and you know, with this, you can see the differences between each batch and each tree. Um, and because, you know, every tree is different, every cask is going to, is therefore going to be different. So there are going to be slight variations between everything. So I think that's really the, the real reason is so that you can track which one you like and which one has slight variance between it. There you go. And there is such difference amongst the trees. Uh, I know that from the Dark Gaelic series, trying those, um, there's huge difference between the trees, which is fantastic to, to experience just to know that trees in different parts of the same forest lend such different uh, contributions to the whiskey. And for anyone who is out there questioning things like terroir, um, they only have to look at even just the wood component. I mean, everything is different. Everything is has a contribution to whiskey, every element of the of the process. So why wouldn't the tree and why wouldn't the, the lay of the land and the field and the gradient for, for barley change the end product? Uh, it exists. Yeah, I mean, if, if our, our friends in Waterford or any anything to be believed, you know, uh, every element that you put in is, is gonna is gonna change it. But in the same way as if you're baking a cake, if you change the ingredients, the, the end product is gonna taste slightly different. So everything you put in has an effect on, on what comes out. And I, I'm a big believer in that. Um yeah, so I mean why why wouldn't these things have an effect if it's sitting in wood for 10 years, 
that's certainly going to have a, a, an effect on, on how it tastes. One more question before we get back in the bus. Uh, Daniel asks if there's no Irish whiskey being aged exclusively in Irish oak, and the answer is no, there isn't. Uh, it, it's not suitable for it. It's a very porous material too, isn't it? Uh, Irish oak compared yeah. to American hardwood, American oak. Yeah, so it'll, it'll suck up. It'll suck up a lot of the the liquid as well when you put it in. So I have heard stories of when they they initially get Irish oak cask. You have basically have to season them first with new make spirit for you know a couple of months. Um, and just allow it to take some of the tannin out and just allow that that cast kind of uh, take, in, take in some of the liquid so it's not as thirsty when you eventually put in your, your precious, precious, older, older Irish whiskey, you know? Dave Cummins is bursting my storytelling bubble and my, my Shanachy bubble. You, need a, you just need a tree felling license. You got to watch out for those great Irish storytellers. <laughs> They'd tell you anything. They would, and I do. <laughs> yeah. Fair play. All right. So that's the end of my story about uh, sitting in a forest waiting for the tree to fall. It was, it was good. good it was a good. It was a good story, Barry. I will give you that one. I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed it while you were telling it. But I, I, I was. You was know, you said earlier yeah. we were going to tell a few stories, but we we're going to tell a few lies as well. So I think that's the important part. It, the difference between a lie and a story is a story makes you laugh and feel good about yourself. So anyway. On we go. We're getting back in the bus. But oh, I forgot to talk about this before we go. Sexton, uh, as we're queuing up the next whiskey, uh, uh, single malt from the Bushmills Distillery. Uh, first one released under the new ownership, to the best of my knowledge, the first new brand, which was released under the, the Ho Jose Cuervo parent company. It is a single malt, uh, young whiskey, um, but still a not an unenjoyable whiskey, very widely available in the US, getting good distribution, and a lovely sipping single malt. Yeah, I actually really like that when I, when I taste it. And I'm very jealous that of the prices you can get Irish whiskey at in the States because obviously we have the, the second highest excise rate, I think, in, in Europe over here. So it can be very expensive sometimes to, to buy bottles of Irish whiskey. So when I see you talking about bottles that are sub 25 and sub $30 and stuff, you know, um, it, yep. it, there's a little bit of jealousy. No doubt. I, I picked this up for $24.99 yesterday, which is yeah. incredible value. And um, if I bought six bottles, I think I could have got it for 21 and uh, so, yeah, great. Some, but some states are, are higher than others. Every state has different taxes on their liquor as well. But I think for the most part, America has cheaper whiskeys, except for the tariffs now applied to single malt. So I think this could fall under in the future single malt tariffs, uh, as could, uh, I know, Bushmills 21 and Bushmills uh, single malt. So in any case, uh, some, one interesting fact about this bottle, uh, you may not be aware, is that the bottle is actually uh, pays homage and tribute to Northern Ireland and particularly to a very well-known um, tourist uh, uh, destination in, in Northern Ireland. Let me pull up a picture of it here. And that is the Giant's Causeway. And if you look very closely at those um, naturally shaped stones, uh, each of those stones in the Giant's Causeway in, in County Antrim um, are shaped, uh, the bottle is shaped uh, like them. So it pays tribute to that, bot uh, to that uh, stone formation, which draws people from all over the world uh, just to see it. So I thought that's yeah, it, it definitely is. And it's definitely one of the most beautiful parts of Ireland. So again, if you are visiting the Bushmills Distillery, you have to get out to the Giant's Causeway. It's just, uh, it's a given that if you're in Ireland, if you're doing a lap of the lap of the country, it's definitely something you have to see. That's it. That's it. Johnny's right. Why wouldn't we try whiskey at that price? Exactly. All right. So I'm sipping on this one and now we're, we're back in the bus. We've done uh, Bushmills, Kilbegan, Tullamore. Um, do we have to go further east now to the next place? Yeah, we we will we'll head for the actual capital, will we? Cork. We're going to Cork again. No, apparently that's the real capital. The actual capital would be uh would be Dublin. So the political we, capital. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess I guess yeah. we can start off with the, the Dublin Liberties Distillery and we can talk about the whole region um and, and the name behind it. <laughs> All right, we are going to the Dublin Liberties Distillery, and that is my cue to pull up a picture of the Dublin Liberties Distillery. Yeah, I think Dublin Liberties is a, is a beautiful distillery, and as the name obviously states, is in the heart of the Liberties in Dublin. So in D8, and Dublin is the postcode, and the Liberties is so-called because previously, back in the day, um, back many, many years ago in Dublin, that part of the city was was outside the city walls and the people who lived there were at liberty. So they, they weren't necessarily uh, beholden to the tax systems and stuff that were 
uh, applied inside the, the walls of Dublin. So it definitely became a hotbed of distilling after that. And it's part of the Golden Triangle. And basically, the next four distilleries that we're going to kind of flick through um, are all located within walking distance of each other. So, I mean, from Bushmills, from Dublin to Bushmills is three hours. And then you're talking three and a half hours back down to Kilbegan and Tullamore. But all these are within five, six minutes of each other anyway, kind of of walking, even not even driving. And I went to uh, visit the Dublin Liberties Distillery last year with uh, buddy Mark Bergen, uh, who's whiskey or whiskey on uh, Twitter. And every year when I go, come over to Ireland for Whiskey Live, Mark and I will hit up a different distillery. We started with Teeling two years ago, and then we did Dublin Liberties last year, which was a great old time. And my first time visiting the Dublin Liberties Distillery. And uh, it's got a Bushmills connection too, uh, because it's master distiller. Darren McNally uh, was the former uh, master distiller. Wasn't he? He, was, he was the master distiller in Bushmills or he was... He was in Bushmills for many years. He was in Bushmills for many years, yeah. And I think since they opened in just just in 2018, um, I think they opened. They've been doing some cool stuff and they've, they've got some cool brands. But they actually have, I, I was just looking today, and obviously we're talking about the the visitor experience. But I, when I was on their website today, I, I noticed they have their cask purchase program open as well. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago about different casks and that kind of thing. But they actually have a tiered system where, uh, one cask is five grand, so I think it's from cask 150 to 300 is five grand. Cask two to 150 is 10 grand, and number one cask out of the distillery is, is 150 grand. So if you if you want the number one cask out of the distillery, Barry, there you go. You just have to pull together all your stories and sips money, um, and your your communion money, and put it in a little envelope and get a get your first cask. Get a cask. We'd have to sell a lot of stories and sips uh, turtlenecks to get that cask. I'd say, but you never know. <laughs> That's where the money is, Barry, selling those turtlenecks. But yeah, back to the back to the distillery. I, I was lucky enough to when I when I did visit the distillery that I had Jeff Spearin, who was the, the previous global ambassador um for, for the distillery, kind of showing me around. And he gave me a really cool tour. And I, I think they have some obviously most of their whiskey at the moment is sourced, um, but they have some really cool cool whiskies. You know, they have the, the Copper Alley, which is a 10-year-old single malt, which I have a, a particular love for it. I thought, thought it was a great whiskey, but all the whiskies are named after, um, you know, different little bits of uh, about the about the area and about the region. For example, their their twenty seven year old, which is the the king of hell, is named after a guy called Richard Parsons, who who was who founded the Hellfire Club, which is a, an infamous place located up in the Dublin mountains. You know, and it was known for all kinds of satany and villainy and all all these kind of devil worship and nihilism and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they obviously named their their twenty seven year old whiskey whiskey after him, but it's a very cool little tour. It's um, there's some great whiskies to try, and they always have some uh, beer finished cask finishes in the in the distillery shop as well to pick up. And there's a nice little coffee shop there as well if if, if one is so inclined. And it's got that. I just showed a video there. I'll show it again. But it's got this wonderful uh, bar area. When you finish the tour, you just come off the yeah. come, come come out of the uh, of the distillery floor. In fact, you'll find this beautiful. Uh, wooden beamed bar and tasting area that you could while away a few hours there sip, sipping on some lovely stuff. Um, so they're in safe hands there with their master distiller, uh, Darren McNally, and uh, there, there'll be some interesting releases coming from them over the next few years. But I know that a lot of these visitor centers that we're sharing, we're sharing them not just because they're great destinations, but because they're also going to need our support and our help because they have been massively hit. So distilleries that are still sourcing whiskey but have a visitor center are mostly relying on visitors and tours and merchandise and gift shop sales to keep the lights on. So as soon as it's possible to get to these visitor centers and it's safe and healthy and you feel comfortable doing so, uh, I think we should all make it uh, as uh, uh, much of a priority as we can to visit places like DLD. Yeah, and I think what the lads are saying, Daniel's saying there, the DLD visitor special or the bar is, is special. And I think the next the next four kind of distilleries we're going to talk about, they all have beautiful kind of uh, internal bars, restaurant, uh, cafes, that kind of thing. And it's a pity the bars don't get used more. And I think certainly in in times to come now when we can visit distilleries again, yeah, the, the bars are just, there's something special, especially up there in DLD. I think it's a really, really cool one. Probably one of the most underutilized spaces in the in the capital. I remember when I uh, last year when I visited, I was staying across the road in the hotel across the road that looks out over to the distillery. And I looked out the window. I got up one morning and I looked out the window and there was a truck emptying, uh, emptying the barley. 
uh, into the or there's a shoot comes out of the distillery and it sucks the barley into the into the the um, distillery and i thought to myself what a sight that is to see grain being delivered in the city center of dublin for use in a distillery what a, what a return to good times yeah and i believe there was all sorts of planning issues as you can imagine trying to get the, the you know um trying to drop off barley you know trying to create a shoot to drop off barley in the in the middle of dublin city in a in a very old building um and because i i think the area it's in is called black pits so it was previously the area of the liberties where stuff like leather would have been uh there would have been tan and leather and this kind of thing so you know it's, it's known as the black pits and uh, so it is a pretty old historic building has had i think it's gone through i remember jeff telling me it's gone through you know five or six more uh different uses over over the decades and over over the years you know there was only just enough space for that truck to deliver uh, and and no more space like no cars could pass it for the few minutes that it stayed there while the vacuum system sucked that barley up uh, but it it is uh i can imagine the challenges yeah going into getting getting planning for that kind of industrial nature right there in the city center yeah yeah uh, you know i think setting up anything like that in dublin city in any city is is just going to you're just going to have such issues because the buildings they have there are obviously beautiful and i think we'll talk about Paris lines in a bit which is a a particular chat was a particular challenge in and of itself but uh yeah fair play to any company that goes in and sets up in a city and tries to get planning and work out all the the various bits and pieces they have to work out because it's it's an absolute minefield let's say unreal you mentioned jeff spear and the brand ambassador uh, with them um, mark mentions there that we had a great old day there where he he gave us a drop of the 27 year old king of hell um, which was remarkable uh, altogether. And uh, I wonder if everyone, get, hopefully everyone on the tour gets a drop of the 27-year-old at the end. Be, that'd be very nice for everyone. Um, Chris Hennessy uh, weighing in on the Black Pits reference, mentioning that's the name given to the Teeling's next peated malt, Black Pits. So great to, to honor the local uh, names like Black Pits. <laughs> a marketing agency couldn't have come up with that. They'd have deemed it too uh, disgusting a name. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think they they would have they would have uh, vetoed that one, all right. But it is part of the the history of the region. And when we talk about that, you know, when, when, when I'm talking about yeah, the region that that area is called the Black Pits. Basically, their back wall then is is uh, Teeling Distillery as well. It's it's amazing for an area that had no distilleries seven eight years ago, well six years ago, because I mean Teeling's fifth birthday was this week. So six years ago there were no distilleries, and now there's four within a stone's throw of each other now. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so, um, where will we go next? It'll only be a stone's throw wherever we're going in Dublin. What, what one will we go to next? I suppose we'll go to Teeling. We'll go to the back wall of uh, of Dublin Liberties Distillery there and just hop over the fence and go into the Teeling Visitor Centre. So, Teeling celebrating their fifth birthday, fifth anniversary this week, released this graphic during the week to show what they have <coughs> done over the past five years. Some amazing numbers there. Half a million people have visited the Visitor Centre. And uh, nearly 25,000 barrels have been filled and um, they've sold at the visitor center over 200,000 bottles in the last five years, which is incredible, but also highlights just how important visitor centers are to distilleries where they do so much trade from tourists visiting and coming to see a working distillery. Because I know that before Teeling opened up, there was no working distillery to come visit. If you wanted to see Irish whiskey being produced, you could have gone to Jameson Bow Street Distillery. Uh, but I'll put distillery in quotation marks because it's not a distillery, of course. It's a it's a homage to what was a distillery. Uh, but you have to go to Teeling. You had to go to Teeling to see a working distillery. So it's great to see that they've done so much trade from that gift shop. I'm hoping that when the doors open up, they'll do that again. So incredible numbers there from them. Yeah, and I, I remember the first time. I guess it's probably yeah four and a half years ago. Oh, it was that was the first time I visited the distillery. I'd never been to that part of Dublin City. And I remember just walking in around, and I, I had no clue where to go really even. Um, and yeah, just just rocking into the the Teeling Distillery, and it was really cool. It's it's really cool now. It's it's come on so much. The whole like you know what I mean when you have it's almost the the distilling heartland there of, of Dublin, um, and they were the first guys to do it. So there there has to be a lot of credit paid um, to to Teeling, um, and there are a few different options and um, variants there in terms of tours that are available so you can obviously get your standard trinity tasting which is you know very much teething are all about the, the standard trinity between the the small batch and the single malt and the, the single grain and you can get more advanced tastings which bring you up depending on how much how much you want to spend as well um, but it is cool to be able to walk in around 
it, I remember at the time to be able to walk in a, around a working distillery in the city, you know, it, it was just the first of its kind. And thankfully we've, we've added since, yeah, I can see, see the video you took there. Um, it's just a yeah. cool little thing to have in the middle of the city. I mean, the um, fact that you can walk around within within a foot of the of the uh, of, of the tanks and the stills there uh, and see it in operation uh, is is pretty remarkable. And um, yeah, like to, like to your point, it is for people who often visitor centers show you historical aspects of things. They don't always show you things working because many f distilleries are big factories and industrial complexes that can't won't let you near. But Teeling, you're right up you're right up next to the the vats and the the vats and the stills you're rubbing up against the stills well hopefully you're not rubbing up against the stills but you know what i mean but i think one of the one of the cool things as well is it's a bit of callback to one of the earlier distilleries we were talking about so alex chasco who would have previously um worked you know cooley and kilbegan uh and now is the the master master distiller in teeling so we can see that there is a bit of a not a circular nature in Irish whiskey, but you know it, it is a small little community, and there do tend there does tend to be a lot of flitting around and jumping around from place to place. So we talked about Daryl previously from Bushmills going down to DLD, and Alex Alex going from the guys in Cooley and Kilbegan and coming down to Teeling a few years ago. And Alex Chasco, the master distiller at Teeling, is an American, uh, and uh, the Irish have allowed him to distill. Uh, despite his American background, but no, he's a he's a, a experienced brewer and distiller, and uh, spent a lot of time working with uh, with John Teeling, um, and before before going to Teeling, uh, before going to Teeling whiskey, uh, working for the parent, uh, the father of the two brothers who started Teeling. Uh, so yeah, uh, good good distilling and brewing chops. And and again, the when we talked about the bar and TLT, they have the Bang Bang Bar, which is uh, on the top floor of the Teeling Distillery, which again is just a really cool place. And if you want to try out basically any of their any of their stuff, it is a, a great location. And they have a hand fill bottle and stuff, which is a great little addition to any distillery to be able to get a hand fill with your name on it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a nice little bar to be able to go up and have a drink and have what you want after you do your tour. It is. It's a lovely little bar. I remember in 2018, November 2018, I sat there. It actually, was. The night before I saw you in the in the Palace Bar for the launch of another whiskey, if you remember, uh, back in the day, I got a, a text from Michael saying, "What are you doing tonight?" And I said, "Nothing." He goes, "You are now. You're coming to the whiskey <laughs> launch with me at the Palace Bar," <laughs> and I and I rolled in as if I, as if I owned the joint, thanks to an invitation from yourself. But but that morning I sat at the Teeling Bar and sampled the first single pot still whiskey to be distilled in Dublin in more than 40 years. So Ding, uh, Teeling responsible for the first, yeah, the first single pot still, the last distillery to have produced single pot still in Dublin, of course, being Powers in John's Lane in the early 1970s before those stills were decommissioned and they moved to Middleton. So there was this 40 year gap or 40 plus, 45 plus year gap until Teeling distilled. And now Teeling have brought back single pot still distillation to the city, which is another first uh, in the current generation of Irish whiskey production. Yeah, but it's a pity, unlike the John's Lane Distillery, they don't have any steam engines involved, which I thought was a great part of the John's Lane Distillery. So maybe if a distillery can bring back steam engines in the future, mm. it might not be the most efficient way to distill whiskey, but it'd certainly be old school. Steam engines and and uh, and fellas waiting in forests for trees to fall. I can see this new Ireland we're envisioning. It's kind of a an, an Eamon de Valera Ireland, a return to... <laughs> <laughs> we're, going, we're going backwards in time, I think, Barry. Yeah, but... It's uh, just when we mentioned when we mentioned the the John's Lane Distillery, uh, and I, I don't think we we have it on the list. But when you are in the area, the John's Lane Distillery, the old John's Lane Distillery, it's now the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. But you can go in and you can walk around and you can see the old stills, um, and there is a, a little guided route around now. Where you can see some of the old remnants of what was the the Powers John's Lane Distillery, and it's again it's less than a ten minute walk from from the Teeling Distillery from uh, DLD as well, you know. That's right, and it's great to see that if you, if, when you're walking up by John's Lane, you look up on some of the buildings, you can see the diamond P that's on the front yeah. of every bottle of Powers. It's still there, embossed on those buildings that would have held the offices of the Powers family back in the eight, late 1700s, early 1800s. And even some of the houses, a lot of the housing estates that are built around the area, up in the Liberties, you know, they were they were built by the Powers family for some of the workers. So they they have different names which are related to different parts of the Paris family and they had their local church up there. So the, the area, the Liberties itself, is absolutely steeped in distilling history. 
Dave mentions that he'd love the National College of Art and Design to fire up those stills and get them going. So there's, I think there's is a two stills I think they have out yeah. in the courtyards in the National College of Art and Design. And then there's another one of the stills has made its way down to Middleton and sits in the, in the, on the grass in front of the old Middleton distillery, uh, which, is, which is a little bit more polished than the ones in the College of Art yeah. and Design. I, I think it's just mostly people sitting in and on the ones in the College of Art and Design now at this point. But I think over the last number of years that the guys in Powers developed a bit of a better relationship with the National College of Art and Design. So there is an actual, you can pick up a leaflet that tells you a little bit about the distilling history and, and what everything is located in around there. But it is a, a little cool stop off. If you are in the Liberties area um, and you're going to visit, you're there to visit distilleries anyway, you might as well throw the head and have a little walk around. It's fantastic when you look at those stills in in, the, in John's Lane. They're they're on concrete like brick uh, plinths, but those are actually the furnaces that were underneath the stills. And you can see where there's little doors that they would have put in the old fuel. I uh, I was recently recently enough, and I think he's watching. I went up to visit Brendan up in Killowan, and he has the the little brick. Uh, you know, he has the the brick built around the bottom of the stills as well. So it is a real throwback to what the stilling was back in the day. So. Yeah, I, I always think it's a, it's a really cool thing to have in, in modern days distilling, even with the direct fire and that as well. Graham is enjoying the sexton, very full-bodied, I agree. It is very yeah. flavorful for 40% and for, for a younger single malt. Uh, nice little one to have on the shelf. And if you can get it for the price I got it for $24, you'd buy it all day long. There's a, there's a big whack of sherry in that, I think, isn't there? There's a big sherry component, I think, would give it the that kind of full-bodiedness that it, that it has in it. The only problem I have with this bottle is how hard it is to pour it. It drips all over the place. There's more now dripping down the table than there is in the glass. I'll be licking the table all night. No, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I, I totally I totally agree with you. But uh, yeah, I, I remember myself and a friend opened one one night and there was there was whiskey everywhere from us trying to pour it into small Glen Cairns like this. I think if you're pouring it into a big rocks glass or something, you, you might have a better job, but yeah. Or a bucket. Get yourself a good bucket and a straw and then you'd be grand. Yeah. Um, so we're... We're going to move on to our next distillery. We're going to move on and uh, not too far away at all. I think we're going over to, uh, are we going to go to Pierce Lyons? Yeah, we can go to Pierce Lyons. Sure, why not? Great stuff. Jeff is killing his last bottle kill, uh, teeling hand fill from the distillery. Great stuff. You're keeping it on brand for our live stream tonight, Jeff. Good man yourself. Yeah, and the, the cool thing about teeling, or the interesting thing about teeling certainly is they, they have so many different bottlings for so many different markets that, you know, somebody could pull up one and say, you know, there's this Chardonnay cast finishes and there's, you know, rum cast finishes. There's, there's everything, everything you could possibly think of. They've probably done at this point. And there's many more interesting things to come. Speaking to Rob Caldwell this week on the podcast, yeah. talking about the, the wood types that they're experimenting with from around the world. Wait till you see what's coming down the road. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's only good for All right, so It absolutely is. Absolutely. So we are going to go to Ireland's, in my opinion, and I can, I'm can i open to criticism on this, Ireland's most beautiful distillery, Pierce Ireland's Lyons Distillery. Ireland's most beautiful. I, I, I don't disagree with you. And also one of Ireland's most um, unexpectedly expensive distilleries, I think, is how it turned out in the end, because the St. James's Church, uh, which houses now the, the Pierce Lyons Distillery, it is a deconsecrated church. And when... Pierce Lyons, um, you know, undertook the project previously. Pierce Lyons, who's now passed away, sadly, when he undertook the project initially, I don't think he envisaged how difficult and how expensive it was actually going to turn out to be. But if you haven't been there, it is an absolutely fabulous tour. And I think this one really stands out for me. The Pierce Lyons tour really stands out for me because it is a very different tour because they talk very much about the history of the church and the graveyard, which is a, which is attached to, um, and it is very much about the history of the area. And, you know, all of the distilleries in the Liberties very much talk about the history of the area. But Pierce Lines really brings it to another level because they have various graves and maybe we can touch on the various people that are they're buried there in the distillery, you know? That's right. Um, I was surprised when I first came across it. I, I didn't know what to expect. I hadn't, when I, I first visited in 2018, I'd never tried their whiskey. And um, typical Cork man entering with a bit of healthy skepticism. And then in Dublin, here I don't know about this now, but sure, we'll go in anyway, we'll have a look. And I went in and the tour started out with a historian walking us through the history of St. James Church and saying, oh yeah, by the way, James Power is buried over there and your mouth drops and you realize, okay, we're, we're onto something big here. We, I, should pay, I should pay some attention. And, and sure enough, it only gets better from there. 
and then you walk into the building and what they've done inside is create nothing short of an absolute masterpiece of, of architecture. Yeah, and the the Lyons family who owned the distillery, they were very, very involved in the construction of the distillery, I believe. Uh, Mrs. Lyons, who was uh, Pierce Lyons' uh, wife, is actually a stained glass artist, and she was the one that did all the stained glass on the in the distillery, which is an unbelievable feature of, of the distillery. You can see it there behind the stills. And the still, again, in itself is interesting because there's a you know two stills with a bit of a hybrid on it, so it's a it's kind of a two and a half times distilled Irish whiskey, which is unique in and of itself. We had Connor Ryan, the global spirits ambassador for Pierce Lyons, uh, on a few weeks ago. And for those of you who want to do a deep dive into their whiskies and the story, then I I recommend you check out a past episode of the live stream on YouTube or Facebook, where all the episodes are archived. But he was sharing some great stories and and just. You could see how passionate and excited he was about the, the content he had to share and the information he was gifted to be able to pass on to others. But the history is unbelievable uh, for that area of Dublin and that building. Yeah, and I think we, we haven't even touched on what is probably the most impressive part of the distillery as well. It's not the stills, it's not the stained glass. It is the uh, the glass tower, which comes out of the, the steeple, uh, the, the glass steeple, which comes out of the top of the church which is incredible. You can see there, it lights up. Um, and my only thought the first time I saw this was that must be a nightmare to clean. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what that says about me, but all, all I could think was I, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine how you'd get up to clean that because with Guinness, with the Guinness brewery around, um, there's certainly, you know, going to be some vapors and stuff floating around in the air there. I, I'd say seagulls. It gets very dirty, very quickly. Seagulls. Yes. I uh, I think they shared the story. They did share the story on the tour about how the building, when it was first acquired, didn't have a steep, uh, didn't have that spire, a spire at all. And so yeah. they presented options for reconstructing and rebuilding it, and none of them seemed to either be accepted or or fit them aesthetically. And eventually, they made this bold suggestion to to propose to make it out of glass as a beacon uh, that people could see across the city. And amazingly it got both planning permission and it was able to be put in place yeah and i think from the initial investment or the initial looking at the the plan initially the cost of the distillery increased kind of four or five fold because the distillery or the the building itself the church itself was a listed building so everything had to be more or less kept in place all the bricks as they are so yeah it was just an incredible undertaking and i don't think anybody um who wanted a simple life or an easy life would have, would have undertaken that project. It's almost like nothing in whiskey is quick is what I'm hearing from you or cheap. <laughs> uh, yeah, I certainly, that, that's a, that's a good link to make back to it. All right, probably, but you could look at it that way. And I think Pierce Lyons himself is a man who not many people, maybe not many people knew about before he built the distillery, but intimately involved in the reconstruction of Middleton um, or the, the construction of the new Middleton distillery as it was at the time back in the 70s. I went on to found uh, his own his own company, which dealt mostly in, in yeast. Um, so they, they very much talk about their yeast strength when you go in and do the tour in the distillery. And it's one of the, the parts that kind of marks them apart. But they have some fantastic whiskies uh, there as well. And the seven-year-old that I've mentioned a couple of times to you on Various various platforms and things is, is fast becoming one of my favorite drinkers as well. And after Connor Ryan, the Global Spirits Ambassador for Pierce Lions, was on the show a few weeks ago, he he texted me afterwards and he said, I was I was almost about to share, but I couldn't really share because I can't really share yet. But here's what's coming next, and here's what we have coming down the road. He said, Please don't share it with anybody. So I won't share it, unfortunately. But what I will say is that they are doing really interesting things, and there's something very, very interesting coming in a few months that we should all pay close attention to. So I'm excited to see what comes out of Pierce Lions. Yeah, definitely. And I remember Michael Carr as well, who, who, uh, who works there, who, who's another, uh, another part of the distillery and one of their brand ambassadors slash, you know, seems, seems to do a lot of stuff down there as well. Um, but he shared some of the different drinks with me and different, different drops with me. And they were doing a blend, they're doing blended malt whiskey, you know, so they were one of the first places in Ireland. Again, we had no blended malt whiskeys maybe five months ago. And now we have two between that and the Liberator. Um, and again, open to correction if there's any others. But, you know, we're they're doing some really innovative stuff and some really cool stuff in there. It's a, it's a very small distillery, a very small setup. 
but yeah, it's just a, a great place for innovation and a beautiful, beautiful tour. You know, it's a really exciting, interesting time for Irish whiskey that will never be repeated, I hope, again, because you can just say there really easily, and there's two vatted malts in Ireland right now. We know, like, you know almost every vatted malt and every this and that that's in Ireland right now. Like, we know what's happening. Yeah. That does, in, the, in the bourbon world, that's not possible because there's just so much happening. There's And the scotch world. So I'm looking forward to a time where you don't know how many vatted malts there are <laughs> and that's coming, right? Because that will mean that there's so much going on. Yeah, and I think if you look at even stuff like cask programs and stuff that are going on, you know, various distilleries setting up, there's going to be a lot of whiskey floating around in a few years' time that people are either trying to sell or create brands to try and get rid of. So I think there's going to be a lot of interdistillery cask trading and you're going to see blended malts and blended grains and, you know, you're going to see all manner of, of different combinations of, of whiskey. Hopefully, I hope. Uh, I mean, we're up to 31 distilleries in Ireland. That's when I checked last week. It could be more at this stage. Um, you're talking over 100 in Scotland and you're talking in the thousands in, in the US. So, yeah, at the moment, we can kind of almost keep track on things, but it's fast going the way that we can't. And that's what we want to see, really. We want it to be a point where, oh, have you heard about this? No, I haven't heard about it. Like, you know, tell me about it. You know? That's right. I long for a day when we have no clue what's going on in the Irish whiskey world. Such a <laughs> Complexity. <laughs> Mark has visited Pierce Lyon six times. Mark is a, a great ambassador for whiskey in the Liberties area and in a great knowledge on, on whiskeys and bourbons as well. Uh, and Mark, uh, I visited, I've now visited two Liberties distilleries with Mark and Mark will do a third. Maybe we'll do Row and Co next when I, when I come back. John says that uh, the spire is called the Liberties Lantern. That's right. I forgot about that. And let me see. All right, so uh, where else? We have one more left to go in Dublin, I think. We don't have far to go, though. No, we have, a, again, a stone's throw down the road, probably less than 500 metres down the road, to Ronco. And I believe, yeah, the, it is the newest distillery on our list for tonight. Opened up about a year ago this week. Yes, Row & Co., um, a distillery and a whiskey brand that has been resurrected by the parent company of Guinness, Diageo. And Rowe & Co. has a rich, uh, the uh, Rowe whiskey, George Rowe has a rich whiskey history in the uh, Liberties area in the the old whiskey triangle in Dublin, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it would have. Um, so Rowe & Co. was one of the, the largest, or Rowe, George Rowe would have been one of the largest whiskey distillers in the Liberties area back in the early 1800s. And he would have been one of the richest men in Dublin at the time as well. And, you know, really story, really story brand that the guys in Diageo have... Uh, have revived and it is a fantastic looking distillery again like everywhere we've talked tonight and they're all very different the ones that are set in the city because they were using existing buildings you're, you're talking you know very very different distilleries very different layouts very, very different setups um and the Ronco distillery is situated in the old powerhouse uh, or power station for for guinness so there it, there is a bit of a feel about it you know there is that kind of uh, industrial bit of a feel about that old school industrial i mean the bar downstairs and i've often said this to people the bar downstairs has the, the feel of a, a berlin nightclub because you know it's that power station kind of feel and everything can be steel and industrial and i just think it's a it's a really cool place but the tour itself is very much focused on the mixability and you know how rowan coal works very well in cocktails as well you know they, they bring you through obviously the distilling side of things and the, the creation of the liquid and then they talk about how it can be used in different types of cocktails and very much um, how it's a, a very mixable whiskey, I think, is, is what they're, they're trying to get across in the tour. It's nice to see a distillery that has both a foot in the past, but also recognizing the use of Irish whiskey in cocktails. So we, we have many whiskey purists who would never see whiskey uh, in anything other than in a glass, neat, not a drop of water added, just as it is. But... Row and Co have led with no. It's this is a this is also a cocktail whiskey, and we want to make the most of that. And we think you should try it and enjoy it. Yeah, and I think what cocktails do, or what any mixed drinks do with whiskey, is it, it makes it more approachable sometimes for a market who maybe haven't tasted whiskey before. But in addition to that, a good cocktail made by somebody who knows what they're doing is a fantastic addition to the flavor. So they're using the flavors that are already there in the whiskey to create something which is you know even more flavorful or can play on a different element of the whiskey as well. And um, Alan, uh, who works there, who's their, their global brand ambassador, uh, created the, the menu for the bar downstairs. And it's just, 
it, yeah, they have a really cool menu, really cool drinks uh, in the bar, in the powerhouse bar. They, they do uh, powerhouse Fridays, or they were doing powerhouse Fridays, obviously, before COVID-19 struck. Um, and it is a really good place to go in, have a little drink, have a little look around, and see, again, one of the more modern takes on Irish whiskey production. Um, and their, their master distiller, uh, uh, Laura Hamey, was previously working in Scotland, and she is a she is a Scot, as many good Irish whiskey distillers or great Irish whiskey distillers have been down the years. And it is interesting to see the approach she takes to distilling whiskey in Ireland again. One of the few, if not the only, female distillers in Ireland, and part of a a predominantly female team that leads the leads Rowan Co, which is uh, fantastic to see, and 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 always inspirational to younger girls to see that uh, that that there are jobs that are that are available to them outside of the traditional jobs and uh, i know mrs stories and sips often talks about how she wishes she was told she could have been a distiller and yeah. she was never told she'd be a distiller and so it's great to see that uh, um, a female team leading the leading the distillery there yeah and i think isn't that the saying if you can't see it you can't do it so it is absolutely great and they are producing some some really cool stuff um, out of the the Rowan Co Distillery and the Rowan Co brand and yeah just I think being able to talk about it and the being able to use it however you want and be able to use it well in cocktails be able to drink it neat on its own um, it's just important because it opens it up to a wider audience and you know more more consumers um, but it is definitely a beautiful building really well a really really classy and well done uh, distillery and well done tour. I'm looking forward to doing it next time I'm back. I, I've missed it the last the last time I was home, and so maybe Mark Bergen, get your get your boots ready. We'll do a walk around that next time. Next time we're back. Um, Graham says Rowan Co at forty five percent and non chill filtered is a good whiskey to start the night. That's what he's sipping on now. Great stuff. A lot of history there. And uh, George Rowan and, and my understanding is Row the Rowe family and the Guinness family would not have been buddies or friends through the years. Would have not seen eye to eye, um, and there would have been lots of I suppose skirmishes over even accessibility to the grains and and whether distillers or brewers were allowed should should have had access to the barley in tough times and they wouldn't have seen eye to eye. Yeah, I think there was always a, a bit of tension back in the days in Ireland when there was that that between distillers and brewers and you were fighting for a limited market and you know you were fighting for limited resources and I think everybody was was trying to demonize the other one it was. So, yeah, I think there was plenty of stories about how George Rowe and Arthur Guinness were certainly not the best of friends, or the Guinness family, rather, were, were not the best of friends. Well, the good news is now that it's all been put to bed because Guinness <laughs> owns the George Rowe brand, and uh, that's the end of it. That's the nail in the coffin for poor George Rowe. But uh, uh, good to see it being resurrected. It was the, the Guinness family had the last laugh, I guess. They did, they did. Guinness will give you a few laughs. Um, there's a there's a tunnel. On, my understanding is that there's a tunnel that links both the uh, brewery and the the Guinness brewery and the distillery, which would make for a fantastic upsell on the ticket price when you go to tour Guinness. That for just another thirty euros, wouldn't you like to go in, under this tunnel to our distillery? Well, the the interesting thing about uh, the Rome Co Distillery is you now have Guinness across the road. You have their Open Gate Brewery, which is more their crafty kind of brewery. And then you have the distillery across the road. So they have, you know, big, um, big beer company, big uh, brewery. And then you have your small craft brewery and then you have your distillery. So they kind of have all your bases covered. So if you're in the area, it's again, Guinness is the biggest tourist attraction in Ireland. So there's going to be a lot of people up around the area. Um, so, yeah, they can certainly take in the sites there. So I'm going to move on to my, my third and final whiskey before we wrap up. There, there's a few questions I'd love to get your thoughts on, Michael, because I'm quite far removed from it, 5,000 miles away in the west coast of the US right now. But my understanding is that there was an announcement today uh, in Ireland that is moving up the opening of certain businesses. Does that include distilleries? Does that include bars? Do you, do you understand what's happening? Again, again my, my understanding is um, June 29th is the date um, that most of everything will be, will be opening or starting to open back up again. Again, my understanding from bars particularly is that a lot of them are going to wait um, and just see what happens or, you know, going to wait, wait it out for a little bit longer because with social distancing rules and that kind of thing, 
um, it, it's going to take them a little bit longer because they, they just want to feel it out because the market they're, they're going to come back to is going to be very different for the first few months. So, yeah, I think it's it's still all up in the air, but I think June 29th is what we're all aiming towards. I mean, barbers are open then as well. That was just announced today, so I'm very happy about that. But certainly June 29th is the, is the, is the date the country starts to open back up again in a, in a real fashion. Well, hopefully it happens and it works out in a way that's healthy and safe. I'm here in the US where many states have opened up too early and we're seeing massive spikes of uh, coronavirus in different states. And so I'm I'm locking myself away with a, a cabinet of whiskey behind me until I absolutely have to leave. But I can understand the desire and the demand to get out and get into places and get back to normality. And it's an awful, it's an awful meeting of differing interests and needs uh, where you're balancing health and safety and e- economy and sanity. It's a tough one. Yeah. yeah, I think, look, the numbers in Ireland have been way, way down for the, in terms of uh, people getting the virus, people, you know, uh, sadly passing away from it. But the numbers have been way down for the last week or two. So we are, yeah, we're moving back towards opening up the country. and Hopefully we don't, you know, everything goes according to plan uh, and the bars open back up, the restaurants open back up, the distilleries open back up and, you know, people can start to visit again. And certainly any of your followers uh, want to come over and visit us, Barry, they'll, they'll definitely be welcome um, because the the industry and the, the drinks industry and the tourism industry in Ireland has been very, very hard hit by this. 100%. And we want to make sure that uh, when it's, as soon as it's possible to do so, that we'll bring as many Americans as we can over or or send them on their way with all the instructions they need. What's in your glass now, Michael? What are you sipping at the end of the night? So this is my last one. I'm going to have the Ballyhoo Irish whiskey, so 43%. So out of the, the Connacht Distillery, which is in Ballina County Mayo. This is their blend uh, and has a good proportion of uh, grain whiskey aged in port cast. So there is a nice kind of port element to it, a nice rich element to the whiskey. Um, and for... Connacht itself, so obviously being a Wexford boy, I'm, I'm always interested in this stuff. I mentioned earlier the Banner Island, so obviously Wexford Barley, and I think the guys in Connacht for their own whiskey are using predominantly Wexford Barley as well. So that's another one I'll certainly be picking up when they when they do their, their releases from the distillery. Apparently, uh, when they went to look for that barley, they were out of cork barley, but they went to Wexford as a good follow-up, a good backup. So I'm delighted to see that you got taken care of. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> so I'm also drinking a whiskey that's got a port cast contribution. I'm drinking Velvet Cap. And uh, this is not how it's sold, believe it or not. Uh, believe it or not, it has a nicer bottle than this. Um, it's not too fantastic. bad. Fantastic. I was going to say fantastic branding. Yeah, um, very affordable branding, I think you'll find. Uh, no marketing agency was uh, commissioned in the creation of this. Uh, this is a sample bottle from, Velvet, from uh, Blackwater Distillery. We launched... Uh, um, myself and Omar Fitzel, that's Strand Good, took over their Facebook page a few weeks ago. And uh, for some reason, four and a half thousand people showed up over the, the course of the live stream and the following week to watch that. And uh, we, we think it was for the whiskey, um, not for me and Omar. Others would differ, but I'm not here to, to put words in people's mouths. The word hero is a big word. I, I can't say anything. I mean, that's, it's thrown around, it's it's thrown around a lot these days. Um, the word hero yeah. is thrown around a lot. But, you know, yourself and Omar, heroes, are you heroes, are you not? That's for other people to decide. It's not a word I would use, but in any case, um, delighted to be able to, to hero the brand. <laughs> but in any case, Blackwater Distillery launched Velvet Cap, and it is a sourced whiskey that they're, they are transparently launching, and they have transparently launched uh, while they wait for their own whiskey to mature. It is a blend of malt and grain whiskies, and the blended, finished blend is then further matured or further finished in a mixture of port uh, pipes, Port casks, bourbon barrels, and also uh, no, sorry, no port rye and stout, isn't it? Uh, it's it's a very confusing, yeah. But it's a stout cask that was, or is a rye cask with stout, with rye with stout with rye. I think wasn't wasn't that it? There's something about they they switched it out a couple of times, so it was a well seasoned cask anyway. By the time it came out, I think that's what it was. Yeah. Um, in any case, it, it's made for a lovely whiskey, a very uh, fruity. Uh, I can get the port contribution of it. A lovely whiskey lovely sipping whiskey. And why I'm drinking this tonight in line with all the whiskeys is all of these whiskeys are super affordable. There isn't a whiskey I'm drinking tonight that's that's above 40 euros. In fact, Velvet Cap, I think, is 35 euros or 36 euros or something yeah. similar to that. It's, it's very affordable. And all these whiskeys are 20, 24 euros. So 
I don't want people thinking that we're rocking up here with Redbreast 27 every week and uh, just sipping on that on, on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday. There are other whiskeys we enjoy and they deserve to be heroed just as well. Yeah, and I, I think the great thing is every whiskey has its place, every whiskey has its time. And so and it's, it's all personal, it's all individual. So what you want, what you want to drink at whatever time is, is right for you, you know? The word is that we're doing God's work. That's all the that's all the uh, the assurance that I need this time on a Friday. I'm happy enough with that. Um, <laughs> I've said it for years, Barry. You're doing the Lord's work. Yeah. We like to keep religion and politics out of whiskey, but if somebody tells us we're doing His work, we'll take it. We'll take it. Um, <laughs> Lorcan says I sip the the Redbreast 27 after the stream. Yeah, I've got a half a measure left in that bottle, and it's gone. I've been nursing that for about two months. The, almost the only, gone. Thing I, the only thing I'll be nursing after this is my pillow. Um, because, you know, it gets very late here, Barry. Now, well, it's great. I think that is I'm a happy, good... Happy to that do is it. A, <laughs> no, it's a good segue. It's a good segue to let you off the hook. Um, because you have been a, a, a an absolute uh, gentleman in giving us your midnight to 2 a.m. hour, a uh, couple of hours. Um or later, almost yeah, almost two AM in, in Ireland, which is well, which is unreal. Well, honestly, Barry, the hardest the hardest thing about coming on the, the live stream here is, uh, is not having a drink at it. I had a drink at about six o'clock and I was like, now I'll wait. I sit off now and I'll wait for Barry. And you know, that is really the difficult thing is, you know. Well, what if he didn't wait? Good. Like what if what if the next time you're on, we'll both have three or four drinks to research and then present those drinks and talk about what we've enjoyed. Um, and it'll it'll oil it'll oil the machine a bit. Listen, it's your show. I'm happy to do whatever whatever you dictate. Um, so yeah, you, you just let me know. <laughs> but you know, it might have to go out a bit later after the watershed. That's all I'm saying. Well, look, um, we can go as late as you want. Three, four o'clock in the morning, your time is still only it's only quarter to six in the evening for me. There's early days it's just, yet. Just just the weekend, like it's grand. As Joe says, there's a whiskey for every occasion. There absolutely is. And uh, Graham says that Peter Mulryan from Blackwater is a great man for Irish whiskey. He is. And he's written six books on spirits and a few of them on Irish whiskey. And he's, uh, he's, a, he's a good knowledge on historical mash bills and the, the way pot still used to be distilled. So, yeah, he's worked. Uh, he, he knows his stuff and he's a man to follow. And yeah, he's not afraid whiskey. to shake, shake the boat. Whiskey. So, yeah, there seems to be a lot of that down in Waterford. Um you know, distillers and, and guys who own brands who aren't afraid to to rattle rattle the rattle a few cages down there. But Whiskies of Ireland by Peter Mulroyne is, is certainly one of my favorite and probably one of the, one of the most it was at the time, you know, it's pretty up to date in terms of its its information on, on Irish whiskey. It's a little bit, you know, out of date now just because of the years have, have moved on a little bit and used distilleries have opened. But yeah, fantastic book. Great read. Well look, we've we've had a good old tour. The bus the bus is parked up for the night. <laughs> We're, uh, we're we're both having a drink. The uh, the old tour bus, the whiskey tour bus, is uh, is going to pause, and then we're going to come back in a few weeks, and we're going to do round two, where we uh, include a few places, a few visitor centres that aren't even distilleries, because I know that there's places like uh, Chapelgate Whiskey Company, JJ Curry down there in County Clare, doing interesting things. So we'll cover those in the next few weeks as well. I think. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think there's uh, a few of the smaller ones, definitely. A little bit of a, a spotlight on them could be very, very interesting because there's so many different whiskey experiences now in Ireland, and it's it's there's never been a better time. You know, once everything calms down, there has never been a better time to to come for a whiskey experience to Ireland. Never, never. So, um, for those of you that do enjoy the live stream, and that I would imagine is every single one of you, uh, please <laughs> share. If you're, if you're still here, <laughs> if you're still here. The computer's jammed and you can turn it off and something horrible has gone wrong um, <laughs> or you're enjoying yourself and if you're enjoying yourself would you do us a favor would you share this would you add it to your timeline would you tweet it out would you email a friend would you paste the link somewhere where somebody else will see it paint a sign and stand in the town square and tell people and include the url that they can go visit uh, this uh, live stream every friday we'd be very appreciative because we want to keep building this up and once the pubs open up, we're still going to do this. Michael might not be here every week, but uh, he'll be nursing, um, I don't know, a pillow or going to sleep or doing something, but he won't always be here. But he'll be here as often as he's, he's welcome all the time. Put it that way. Thank you very but much. Thank you very much. Live, 
you're always welcome. We're going to keep doing the live streams every week in any case. And even if we're on the road, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that uh, uh, we, we do this. So um, I think that's it for this week. It's been a great one. A uh, legendary trip around Ireland. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And um, we'll try and get to some of those questions that we didn't answer. I'll jump into this tomorrow. I'll answer more of the questions. Um, I'm going to relax this evening, and uh, you're going to go to bed, presumably. Oh, straight to bed, Barry. I'm, I'm already half asleep here. It's great. Brilliant. Brilliant. All you got to do now is find your way to the bedroom and happy days. Happy days. Cheers, Paul. Cheers, Michael. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks for uh, tuning in again. Another great lock in every Friday. And then uh, next week, stay tuned uh, for a Stories and Sips podcast, new episode being released this week. And we're going to do a deep dive into the launch of a whiskey company and follow the trials and travails of what it takes to establish a whiskey brand around the world. So stay tuned for that. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll talk to you again next week. Slauncher. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Michael. Thanks a million. Thanks, man.